Let's get started. Welcome to Field API is dead, long live entity Field API. So this is the last session of the DrupalCon Amsterdam. It's, we have a lot to tell, so please bear with us for the last hour, but after that you can go to Amsterdam and have a good, nice beer. So my name is Christoph, I'm Swentel on Drupal.org. Uh, also on Twitter, I'm a co-maintainer for the field system. I'm also the original creator of Display Suite. Um, We've got two presenters um, as well here. Um, on the left, there is Wolfgang Ziegler, the real Fago on um, Twitter, Fago on Drupal.org. He is the lead maintainer of Entity API, and he also maintains rules. And next sitting to him is Yves Shedmau, white chat on Twitter, Drupal.org, and he is the maintainer of um, Field API since ages. So we might sound like a little broken record. In that sense, this is probably the fourth or the fifth time that we have given this session already. One of the annoying things was that after a week, maybe after we gave this session, everything was obsolete because we kept changing so much during the Drupal 8 cycle. So this is going to be better right now. We have a better release of Drupal, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the good news for this session. Um, <clears throat> Don't all downhill from there. Yeah. So basically, the APIs are frozen, uh, which means that normally there should be no more changes, hopefully. Uh, we know there are still some areas where little things might change, but basically, if you want to start working with the entity field API, um, you will be pretty okay now. And the slides will not be obsolete next week or in a month or whatever. But the original plan, actually, for Drupal 8 cycle, especially for Eve, was to basically go on vacation. I mean, Field API was in Drupal 7, right? It worked and had its quirks now and then, um, but he wanted to go away for a long time, and but that didn't really happen. Our colleague fall, um, core developers basically just rewrote all the things in Drupal core, and we were like, oh, this is interesting. Maybe we can use that as well. So we did that, um, but that's for the third time. I mean, if you know a little bit of Drupal history, um, Eve has been working on CCK, then Dries asked him to put CCK in, field, in Drupal 7, so then Field API started, and now during the Drupal 8 cycle, we rewrote it again. So, really fun times. So let's start with some side building features. Really nice stuff that has been added to Drupal core. We've added a lot of new field types um, to Drupal core. It allows more power for side builders. Um, they're not always the full um, ports of the Drupal 7 modules that existed, and sometimes they aren't even modules anymore. Modules like number, email, I think. I don't know whether we've moved a, another to core or not. I don't think it's still in progress. Okay, it's still in progress. But some modules don't really exist anymore, but they're there as field types or widgets or formatters, which is really, really great. So we added entity reference to core which is really, really nice. Uh, a lot of work went in there by... <laughs> a lot of work by Andre Amatuescu and Amitaibu. Um, really, really great stuff. Um, we also added date and daytime to core, so you can actually now create event website and things like that. Um, <laughs> Um, some stuff from like the date repeat features are still going to remain in Contrib. I'm actually not sure if anyone is working on that, but if anyone is interested in helping out, we still need that for Drupal 8, of course. We also have a link field, which is relatively basic. We also have an email field, uh, which has input validation. There's no spam um, support out of the box. We don't do that in Drupal core. Um, we also have a telephone field. It does not turn your Drupal website in a Telephone, it's just a formatter, basically, more or less. I'm still wondering why we committed that. But we still have a telephone module in core, which I personally find like, yeah, telephone module. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Just enable it. <laughs> <laughs> it's enabled in the standard profile, so. Um, the nice thing about it is that it all integrates really nicely with in-place editing. So if you look at your node, everything on that page is editable, even the title. It, it took a long time to get the title editable, uh, but that really works nowadays. So, <laughs> A lot of great work there from Wim Leers. Um, he, he suffered sometimes when we did changes, but uh, he made it. Uh, we also have fieldable blocks, which more or less is beans in core. You can add fields to blocks and do whatever you want. Um, really, really nice. 
We also added something that is called four modes. So in Drupal 7, if you go to manage display, um, you have those local tasks like that says default, teaser, full mode, stuff like that. Um, we've added that kind of concept as well to, to forms, which means, um, for instance, if you wanted to have different fields on the registration for users, if you wanted to hide stuff or whatever, then you needed to do some form alters. We also had this little checkbox in field API that says show this field on the registration page and things like that. It was a horrible hack. Um, we removed that completely. You can also now hide fields on forms, which is really nice. So what's the impact on in field UI? There's a new tab, which is called Manage Form Display. You can reorder fields, you can hide fields, and that's also the place where you're going to select the widgets and um, you can change the, uh, the widgets, which is really nice. So you can see here, this is an example of the user um, Manage Form Display. You have default and the register uh, form mode, so you can really adjust it to your likings. Field overview UI is now just um, listing all the fields that you have in your installation. And common is also now a field. So the field itself stores the settings. It does not store um, the comments itself. We still have a comment entity type. And the nice thing is that you now finally can have comments on any entity type that exists in Drupal core, and you can have comments on comments and comments on comments and things like that. So really, really nice work. It was a hard want to get that in as well. Really nice work by uh, Larolan and Andy Post. Um, really, really great. <laughs> so we'll get to APIs now. Um, one nice thing is that there is a cheat sheet. Um, we didn't make it. Um, it was made by Eric Silstra Sutarsson. Um, the link is over here. Um, it helps you figuring out what's new in Entity Field API. You can also work with the Entity Query. So I advise you to download it and just put it next to you if you're working with the Entity Field API. So we're now going to Entities, and Wolfgang is going to talk about that a little bit. Hi. So as Entities are obviously the foundation for, for all the fields, let's have a, a short um, look at all the changes we, we made to the Entity API in Drupal 8. And good news, I think, is we actually have a solid Entity API in Drupal 8 now. So entities really have grown up. Um, so we have a, a full CRUD-supported uh, Entity API in, in Drupal Core. So it's totally built up in classed objects. So no, no standard class objects or anything like that anymore. And we have interfaces and methods on them. So that's really a, a solid foundation that we achieved in, in Drupal 8 pretty fast, actually. And we have done a lot more, but uh, let's get started with, with the basic. So the Entity, Entity Card API in Drupal 8, it's, um, yeah, it has all the card functionality that we could expect, so you can load, save, delete, create. So let's get started with create. Uh, yeah, you have like a, an helper on each Entity Type class, so on the Node Entity class, you have a static create method which you can use to create a new node. You just pass an array of values and you get, get a new entity object. The entity object that you get is actually not yet saved, so you still have to, to call save to permanently save the newly created entity. And also really important for, for all of those entities uh, which have bundles like nodes, which have node types, you have to pass the, the value for the node type when you create the entity. So next thing you, know, you might want to do is load an entity. So we have also a, an aesthetic helper on each node or entity class uh, just to load things. It's really just a shortcut you can use. And once you have loaded an entity, you can delete them. Interfaces, as, as I said, we have entities built up <coughs> in interfaces. We have an entity interface in core, which holds all the common methods, so it makes sure all the loading, saving, deleting, and everything, and some more of that is available on every entity. And in addition to that, we have entity type specific, more specialized interfaces, like node interface. So every entity type in Drupal core also has its own interface, which just extends the, the regular entity interface to add more specialized methods. <coughs> so what are some of those methods which now now on every entity which are on, on entity interface or some related interfaces. So 
you can yeah just use them like to very yeah, common things to, to to get the label of an entity, to get the ID of <coughs> bundle, the URL of an entity, or you have the two array method which you can use to just get an array of all the values uh, which are in the in the entity. We also have like integration with a validation API in, in the entity system, so it actually it's built up in the Symphony validator component. So if you call entity validate, it will fire up a Symphony validator and do um, some validation, which is totally decoupled from form validation, and you'll get back an, an array of violations, or hopefully no violations. And, Sorry, that's and that was huge for REST uh, uh, APIs, because you can post uh, 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 entities via a, a REST call, and it will be validated, even if it has not been submitted to a form, which was like a requirement to be able to do REST things. Yeah, and then there are also like a shortcut stack to check access control on an entity. So we have an access method which you can call to check entity access in a generic manner. Yeah, but as said, we, we also have specialized entity type specific in interfaces in Drupal Core, like the node interface. And we tried in, for Drupal 8 to add um, methods to all of the, those entity types that we have in Drupal 8. Uh, which are uh, specific to the entity type and um, just provide you with all the functionality that's related to the entity type and that you probably want to gonna use. So if you're working with nodes, you likely want to check whether a node is published or a change, the, change with a node is published. So for, for all of that stuff, we, we have methods now. So in that code example, you can see, you can check whether the node is pub published with a method and you can set the published value right just as the node title. And obviously, uh, a node is an entity, so it gets all the, the entity-related methods like saving as well. <clears throat> so for providing an entity type in Drupal 8 Core, you have to, to define a class and put an annotation on it. So it's actually working very similar uh, to all the plugins we have in Core. So this example is uh, a snippet of the node class. It actually has to be located in the right folder as well, so it's, um, in your, uh, from starting from your module folder, it has to be located at the source entity subfolder, and <coughs> you might want to, uh, you should also add uh, an interface for it and just uh, extend entity interface and also then implement your own interface in your own class. Um, we also have like handy base classes um, which you can just extend from, so like a content entity base is a typical uh, base class you, you would like to use. Um, and then you have to put the annotation on top of the class so that the uh, system is actually really discovering also the entity and it's working as expected. Um, the annotation is actually um, what was in, in Drupal 7 uh, entity info, so it replaces all that information. So um, you specify the machine name, the ID of the, of the entity type there, its label, and then also a bunch of, of handlers. So handlers basically are like um, additional objects which uh, allow you to control certain aspects of your entity type. So there are multiple types of handlers already defined in Drupal Core, and, and those types all also come like with its own interfaces, but more important, they also come like with um, useful and out of the box working default implementations. So for example, for storage, there's an, um, a storage handler class in Core which you can just specify and it's working. Um, but the handler system then in addition allows uh, modules like the node modules which uh, want to customize some, some aspects of the entity type to extend those provided classes and put your own classes in place instead. So as node is, um, has just um, some, quite some uh, custom functionality on top of the entity system, it overrides a bunch of um, handlers which Drupal Core provides to add in all the node type specific functionality. So the, the important types of handlers, I would say, in Drupal 8 Core are yeah, storage for all that uh, graph functionality, the view builder, which is used to render an entity, access for checking access, um, views data for views integration, or also forms, uh, which, which basically generate uh, forms for, for, your entity type, for your entity type. So the default form is basically the, the edit form of your entity, but there are also like classes uh, which you can just specify for additional operations, like for deletion, for deleting an entity, uh, we have one as well. Then to leverage those handlers, 
basically you always have to go by the entity manager. So the entity manager really is the, the central service for the uh, entity API in Drupal 8 core. Uh, you, you can uh, get it by calling the entity manager op, um, method on the static Drupal class. Um, but in regular object-oriented code, when you're writing a plugin or something, that's the class you would like to inject in, in, your, in your class. So then from the entity manager, you can fetch all those handy handler objects. And there, there are also methods um, which allow you to, to get them easier um, from the manager, like we have get storage to get the storage, or get form object to get a form object, and so on. Um, yeah, then in addition to that, we have a generic get handler method, um, which basically can work with any kind of handler. And that is because the, the types of handlers that the entity API works with is not are restricted. So core comes with um, a bunch of types of handlers which are useful in, in core, but every contrib module can come in and provide an additional handler to the entity system, uh, which then the entity types uh, can make use of, for, for example, for integrating you with the module. As it's done uh, for, for the fuse module in Drupal core, we have now the fuse data handler, which uh, basically provides solid out of the box fun functionality to integrate the entity type with the fuse, fuse module. But then you might want to override that functionality for your for entity type, uh, so you can just extend the handler and override it. And um, by, by module uh, leveraging that approach, it allows every entity type to um, customize all the, its behavior in, in just in the same way. Yeah, then to fetch information about an entity type, uh, you also get it from the manager. There's a get definition method on it. You just pass it on the entity type ID, and you get back an object. It's Drupal 8. So it's, you, instead ha of having an array that's entity information, we have an entity type object, which is based on, on the entity type interface method, and it just has some useful, useful methods on it, like a method um, yeah, to get its ID, to check when an entity type is revisionable, also to, to get uh, the certain entity keys, like a D revision ID bundle or something. Uh, a really nice feature about the, the new Drupal 8 entity API is also the built-in translation support. Uh, so <coughs> every entity type can be translatable, and uh, you have basically a simple API to, to fetch translations for existing entities. So when you have an entity object, you can call get translation on it, pass it in language code, and you get uh, a new translation object. And that translation object is just uh, a different entity object. It's based upon the same class and is, uh, implements the same interfaces, but it holds different set of values. So it just has, holds the set of values for, for the different language. So that's very neat as you can uh, continue to, to use the same API. You, so you can continue to use like entity type specific methods like node get title. And, and of course, you can also ask like the, the object and which language are you in by, by calling the, the language method. And if you wanna make sure you, you have the original untranslated entity object, you can always call the get untranslated method on an entity object and you will get the entity in the original uh, language as the user has uh, inserted the entity. Yeah, so really great improvements, but we, we figured for Drupal 8, everything should be an entity because everything that's storable and loadable, really it belongs to, to be implemented in our CRUD API. The entity API in Drupal 8 is our CRUD API. So we're doing exactly that. So everything that's in Drupal 8 and none, I would say mostly everything that you can store and load in Drupal 8 is an entity. And for that to work out properly, uh, we basically like, uh, divided the, the API in, in two flavors. So we have content, so we have content entities in Drupal 8. In addition to that, we have like configuration, configuration entities, which behave a little bit different, but are still uh, built up in the, the common foundation, the entity grad API and all the, the common foundational API. So for that to work out, we have two specialized interfaces. We have a content entity interface and we have a config entity interface, which uh, just take care of all the, the specialized functionality which builds on top of the, the common foundation. So for example, when we look at configuration entities, <coughs> those uh, are different as they are stored to the configuration management system. So uh, you can properly deploy stuff. 
<coughs> and the, the actual objects will be uh, just simple entity objects with um, plain entity properties. And we have a dozen examples of that in Drupal Core, but um, some examples you, you probably know of would be like node types or views or image styles. Those are all examples of config entities. Configuration, uh, sorry, content entities, uh, what you probably typically would think of an entity in Drupal 7. Also, they are field-able, um, they are also revision-able, and they are translatable. So content entities combine all those um, capabilities uh, of the entity API and um, are typically um, are stored in some sort of database. Uh, so examples would be like nodes, users, comments, and yeah, all of that. Yeah, content entities, as I said, have fields, so let's have um, a closer look at the feed system. So yeah, during the D8 cycle, the one of the taglines of the work we were doing is that the objective is everything is a field. Okay, so Fago just said everything is an entity, so maybe I need to be more specific. Everything in a content entity is a field, meaning what we what you you usually have on your nodes, say node title, it's a field item list interface. We'll come to those uh, the exact meaning of these interfaces later. If you look at node body, it's the same interface. If you look at a, a custom field added through the the UI, it's a field item list interface. It's the same objects for the runtime uh, entity that you manipulate, uh, whether like. It's a, an, a base field of your entity type, like the node title. Well, the node class is based upon the assumption that nodes, they do have titles. Uh, the node body, it's, been, it's being added to core. It's a configurable field, but like we automatically create it for you when you create a new node type because it's handy, but you can still remove it. Uh, all of those things are, for the runtime system, the, the same thing. So, of course, there are different kinds of fields. We have the base fields which is what in D7 we called like entity properties. So yeah, node title, node need, node author, well, UID. The, the a base field is something that is defined in code. It's defined in code because the entity type module assumes it's going to be there. It's like for the business logic of what is your entity type? What does it do? What is, what, uh, uh, what it is, what it needs in order to require. So that there is some code somewhere that re assumes that nodes have a need, that nodes have titles, and that the title is a string, and that the need is a, is a number. So it's defined in code because code does assumption on that. And we have configurable fields, which was what in D7 we called fields created through the the, the field UI. So the node body, we create it automatically, but it's, it's a configurable field. You can remove it if you don't want a, a body in that specific node type. Uh, the tags, taxonomy, ter, uh, taxonomy fields typically are configurable fields uh, or any other custom field you might want to add to a, a bundle in your entity type. It's defined in, in configuration. It's defined by a, 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 an admin in a UI, and it offers... Uh, as opposed to base fields which, pro which provide the, the like really the business logic of your entity type, it allows site admins to do flexible data modeling without writing code. So all those different kinds of fields, since they are all using the same interfaces, we've been able to uh, generalize a, 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 a series of features uh, that work across all of the, those type of fields. Translation, the whole of, an, of a content entity is natively translatable, while like in D7 you could translate configure, uh, custom fields, but no title was difficult to translate. Okay, great. Field access logic, uh, adding constraint, uh, uh, constraint logic on, on, on your field and, and validation logic, uh, supporting REST uh, operations like get and, and, and post. Uh, using widgets and formatters, and that is nice. You can use widgets and formatters of, for anything within your entity type, including your base fields. We'll come back to that later. Uh, support for in-place editing. 
you define your entity type, you define your base fields, you get free support for, with, uh, uh, for uh, uh, in-place editing without coding anything at all. And that is a nice f feature to get for free. Uh, entity field query, all of, those, all of those fields, whether it's base fields or configurable fields, they work the same way when you try to write a, a, an entity query uh, on those. Field cache, which they all, well, in D7, uh, uh, you have a field cache, meaning all the values of your configurable fields are cached, and we don't query all those tables each time you try to load a node. Since all of them are fields now, well, we had our entity cache, uh, and that is something that we've been working on for, like, years. It's in place now. And probably some other generic features that I forgot on, on that slide. So... <clears throat> How do you work with those uh, uh, field values in an entity that you load or that you create? Just as a quick reminder, this is the Drupal 7 syntax. Lovely. We've all learned to, to appreciate that working with those kind of... But, well, okay. Fields were translatable. They are mul potentially multi-valued. And within a field value, you can have several components. What in D7 we call it like field columns. Uh, so, yeah, the full-fledged syntax, it's that. So uh, the entity module in Contrib tried to, like, introduce some smarter logic to make it easier to access the value in your fields. This was, uh, um, like, enhanced and put in core as the uh, uh, or, um, original, uh, the, the main way to interact with your uh, field values in the entity. So... Just for a recap, so you have an entity, say a node, it implements entity interface. Node body, it's an object that implements field item list interface. It's a list of field values because fields can have multiple values. Of that, you can get the first value, delta zero. It's a field item interface, meaning an item in a field item list. We do allow a, a, a array syntax to uh, uh, access a, 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 an item in that list because the field item list interface they implement array access so you can use still use a, a square bracket syntax and inside of that oh that's wrong it's not a field item interface it's like when you access the value property it's like 42 or hello world or whatever the slide is wrong here um, as a shortcut when you want to access a property in the first value in the, the first delta of your, of your field, you can just say node body value. Uh, so it's slightly uh, easier than, than the, the D7 syntax. <laughs> of course, this is still iterable, meaning you can still mostly work uh, uh, with a uh, field item list interface as if it was an array. You can for each on that. So that's Little drawback is that while for base fields, you could in D7 just say node title, well, the full syntax for that is now node title value. As a mitigation, if, it's, if it is a base field, you're supposed to provide an interface for your, your entity type, meaning you, you are supposed to provide a get title method. Another thing about uh, working with field values is that, yeah, they are objects, meaning we can add some smart behavior on, on top of that. Instead of previously in D7, those were just arrays. So you can do much with an array except reading values that are in there. So if for some reason at some point of your code what you are handed is a field item, for instance, because you receive it as a parameter in, in, in a function, you can still get to the parent entity. You can uh, ask the item for, hey, what language are you in? Uh, you can even, from the item, get its field definition, meaning that it allows you to build simpler code and simpler APIs. For instance, this is the signature of the hook field widget form in D7, meaning the function you need to implement as a widget to provide the form structure for, for a, a editing a field value. The signature you had to receive an array of items, the field definition, the instant definition, the language for the items, because you might want to uh, do specific uh, language behavior, the element that will build, and then, and then the arguments that are specific to the job you are currently building. So building an element, the, the whole form, and the form state, because you're building a form. 
in the eight, this all scales down to just receiving an item because all of the other information, the field, the instance, the line quote, you can get by asking the item. So it makes like APIs look a little simpler. Another nice thing with uh, that, um, the fact that field items are, are objects is, is that we can add some magic behavior and have some computed properties. Um, so if you look at the node tags field, it's a taxonomy reference field. It, can, it typically has several values. If you, if you look at the target ID property, well, this is what is stored in the database. It's the ID of the referenced entity. But if you ask for the entity property, this automatically loads the entity for you, and you get what you get is a taxonomy term. So you can do stuff like term equals node tag entity, and you get your term. This does the entity load for you. Or, and you, of course, you can chain method calls from there. From the node field reference entity, you can get access to the value of a field on that referenced item just by chaining calls. Another thing is that the classes of those values objects, the item list and the item classes, are actually per field type, meaning each field type can, can provide its own classes that both that all extend from the base classes, meaning they can provide meaningful business methods that pertain to the fact of, for instance, being an entity reference field. So node tags, node tags the actual class is not field item list, it's entity reference item list, which has a get referenced entities method, meaning you can load all the entities at once using entity multiple load, which is of course more efficient, just by calling that method. Okay, so now how you define those fields, how you make those fields come into existence. In Drupal 7, the, 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 the definition structures, I try to go quick on that one. Suppose you, you're more or less familiar with that. Like they, we have a split uh, uh, um, definition structure. It's, you have the field and you have the field instance. And well, both of those were arrays, like it's the array PI pattern we've been trying to move away from, uh, like with undocumented properties and you need to remember the exact uh, uh, property names or your code is broken. And so the dollar field was basically uh, what defines the field wherever it appears. And the instance was, okay, how this field appears in the node type, in the node page uh, content type, as opposed to how this field appears in the node article content type. And like for flexibility, most of the actual settings are placed on the instance level because it means you can set, you can make your field act differently on page and on article. Which de facto means that what the field was about was about defining some storage location somewhere. And the fact that you reuse the same field for several field instances, uh, the main use case was just to be able to query this field across several bundles. Be able to write a view that selects all the nodes, whatever the node type, that are tagged with the term DrupalCon. For that to work, the field needs to, the, the field needs to be able to needs to be stored in one single location in storage or else you can't query across uh, bundles. So the, the field it was actually the definition of, of a, a, a data bucket somewhere in storage that you can query. And what we called instance was actually what was a, an actual field on an actual entity. So what we did in Drupal 8 was to put the termin terminologies straight. Uh, and so what we called field in uh, Drupal 7 is now called a field storage and what we called instance is now actually called a field. We were kind of hesitant to make that change because like it's the worst kind of rename you can find. What was named something in the previous version is now, now designates something different in, so at some point we were kind of forced to make that change because the API just didn't make sense. So we went for, okay, let's have something that makes sense for people that come to Drupal 8 instead of carrying the legacy bad names. The other thing we did is uh, move from array uh, definitions to objects with actual interfaces so that you, you can docu we can document what you can actually specify in a storage definition or in a 
field definition. But it's basically the same kind of things you could find in Drupal 7 in field and incidents, meaning the storage. You set the field name, you set the field type, you set the cardinality, a couple settings that might be specific to the field type. And on the field side, meaning the field as it appears in a specific bundle, you can assign uh, a specific label, you can decide whether the field is required or not, um, set a default value, set a couple settings, and you can also access the field storage definition that is associated with that. So you can, once you have the field, you can easily get the field storage. Finding the, de the field definitions, this is like the equivalent API for what, what, uh, what in D7 was like field info field, field info instances and stuff like that. Uh, in D8, you go through the entity manager, and you just ask the entity manager, give me the field definitions for that entity type and bundle, or give me the storage definitions for that entity type since the storage definitions are across bundles. But you can also, when what you have in your uh, code scope is an entity, if you're working on a specific entity, you can ask the entity for its own fields. What are your fields? Give me your field definitions, or give me the definition of your body field, uh, or you can ask, do, do you have that field? Is that field present on, 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 on that entity? And if, you, if what you are working with at this point in your code is a, an, a value, an item, or an item list, you can also add the item or the item list for its field definition. It just makes code easier to write because you can more easily navigate between the thing you're work with, working with and getting the definitions. So the takeaway is that whenever you have, you have to write some code that does something with the fields in an entity, basically you need to work with four interfaces. For the definition, you have the field and you have the field storage. For the values, you have the field and the field item list. That's it. And uh, if, you sub if you write some feature that supports those interfaces, you de facto support base fields and configure fields alike. Okay, so specifically, how do you define configurable fields? Uh, what were the fields uh, in D7? This API has, has changed a little bit. So just a quick recap on, on the CMI uh, initiative in D8. Uh, config entities uh, are, so configuration is it's stored in YAML files. It's deployable uh, between uh, different environments, like between staging and production. Um, Modules can easily ship those uh, YAML files in a specific uh, folder, and the corresponding uh, configuration will be automatically installed uh, when the module is installed. Profiles uh, can do the same. And yes, there are entities. There are config entities. So how do you do your field create field, field create instance? That was the D7 API. Well, the D8 shape is, so you define a storage, field storage config create, you need to specify a couple of properties, like you need to specify an entity type, a field name, and the type of your field. This maps to the, so we have, yes, fields in D8 are entities. They can't have fields, which is good for the sanity of, a, of us all because they're <laughs> config entities. But yes, fields are entities. Deal with it. <laughs> The entity type Everything. is field storage config, and you can find their YAML files in field storage, blah, blah, YAML. And so, yeah, you use them as any other entity. You assign values for them, you save them. Same thing for the field. Um, the entity type is field config. You can find them in field, field, YAML. And of course, field storage config, config implements field storage definition interface, and field config is the config entity that implements field definition interface. You can also easily load them, like field config load by name. You just give the node type, the bundle, and the field name, and it will find that uh, uh, field for you in the configuration. But you should, in D8, rarely have a use case for those. Like, rare, there, are, there should be rare use case where what you want to do is specifically and explicitly work on configurable fields. Most code will work on fields. They will work on the interfaces, not the specific field storage config or field config implementations. 
it shouldn't matter whether a field is a, a base field or a configurable field. Just to give a, a, a visual, visual, visualization of what you can find in one of those YAML files, well, here is a field storage definition. So again, it's what we called dollar field in, 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 in D7. This is basically the same thing. It's a field name, entity type. It has field type, some settings. Uh, whether it's locked, where, what is cardinality, whether it's translatable, basic stuff. And on the field side, uh, you attach it to a specific bundle. You say in that bundle what is label is, uh, whether it's required, blah, blah, default value. Okay, base fields now. Base fields are, are the real new thing in, in, in D8. Uh, how does an entity type say, yeah, my, the, the entities of my entity type will have those fields no matter what? Um, so in your entity type class, the class that Fargo showed that you implement to provide your entity type, you, you define a, a, a there is a static uh, method, base field definitions, where you return an array of the definitions of the base fields you want in your entity type. So basically you call base field definition, create, you give in the field type you want, you set a label, you set whether it's required, you set whether it has settings, you can set a default value as well, you can set validation constraints in there. Um, and your uh, field exists in your, in your entity. So base field definition, it's actually a, a bit special. It implements both interfaces, meaning, uh, well, field storage definition interface and field definition interface, meaning a, the def a base field definition can be seen as a field storage plus a field definition all, on all the bundles of that entity type. Base fields are fields that are present no matter what on all the bundles of your entity type. In addition, we have a hook where other modules can add base fields to your entity type because uh, other modules don't have access to your entity type class. You're the one defining it. Uh, but there is a hook in which they can add more base fields to your entity type. And this is what makes entity types extendable. So there is a way that you can define in code field, uh, base of, well, code defined fields that only appear in that specific, bund that specific bundle and not the others. We won't get into there in, in that presentation, but it's do doable as well. So great thing, you can use widgets and formatters on, on, on your base fields. How do you do that? Well, in that same method, in that same definition, you can set display options for, for the field so that when this field is viewed, it's going to use the string formatter and it's going to use those settings. And on the form side, you can say that it will use the string widget and assign what's the default weight is and again, give some uh, form for, uh, widget settings if needed. You can also uh, specify that those display options that you mentioned are only defaults and that they can be changed in the UI, meaning your base fields can be configured in field UI, manage display and manage forms. Uh, so this gives, uh, this, this lets you remove all the custom code you had to write to support the forms and, and the viewing of your base fields, which is what entity types had to do in D7. You had piles of custom code to define the node form, while now in D8, most of it, it's just reusing existing widgets and it, it gives you the power to reuse the uh, rich widgets that might exist in core or in contrib and just uh, use them for your base field types. So we don't have that split where uh, base fields I had, had a frozen form existence that was completely not configurable, while configurable fields had that rich collection of widgets and formatters where you could do crazy, crazy, crazy things. Now it's all one and the same. A couple words about storage. So, uh, okay, we say uh, we have base fields, we have uh, configurable fields. How is that stored in, 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 in the database? So in D7, the, the field API had a, a, a sub API to allow storage to be swappable, kind of. It was field by field, by field like you could have an entity type whose body field was stored in, in an SQL table, but whose other field was stored in Mongo or whatever. It didn't 
really, really worked. I mean, we, had, we do have a Mongo driver. I'm not sure it's been widely used. And yeah, it, it was kind of a mess because this API was only for configurable fields, leaving the base fields, which are the meat of your entity type, on their own. Uh, in D7, as Fago explained, storing an entity is the job of the uh, entity storage handler, meaning the entities are stored as a whole. Whatever in, is in that entity, the entity, type, the entity storage will store it and will load it, and which makes it, of course, easier to swap out a different logic, for instance, a Mongo storage, because the job of, of that class is to you receive the full entity and just store it, just load it. Uh, it should make a Mongo storage viable, at, at least uh, in D8. Uh, and the core default, of course, we store in SQL. Uh, we have a, an SQL content entity storage. It's a base class that your entity types can simply reuse, and it gives you for free uh, support for revisions, uh, translations, um, fields that have, that have uh, multiple values, fields that have well, multiple properties, meaning the storage of that field takes more than one column in a database. Uh, you get that for free for your base fields, for your entity types, which like really, really removes a, a lot of work uh, uh, for custom uh, entity types. Being revisionable by default just by turning a switch is kind of a big deal. Uh, Schema-wise, well, it's kind of, we haven't seen, things haven't changed much sin, since D7. Uh, it's, uh, you have base tables. You can have several base tables uh, depending on whether your entity type is revisionable or not, translatable or not. Um, you can have one, two, or three base tables. They receive all the fields, all, all the base fields that are mono value because we can't, store, we can't store in a shared table fields that can have several values. SQL is not good at that. So you have one base table that receives all the base fields like in D7, plus we have one table for base fields that can hold several values, plus like in 7, you have one table uh, per configurable field. Uh, one thing, we stopped uh, creating revision tables for entity types that are not revisionable, so it, we should reduce the total amount of tables created in there. And the great news and very recent news is that uh, all of those tables are created for you automatically by the default SQL content entity storage, meaning you don't have to care about defining the schema for your uh, entity type tables. It's taken care of for you and updated automatically for you. That's a great uh, uh, job that was done by Pla Sheffield Jansi Harley. Awesome. So there's more. We're, we're almost at the end of our presentation. There's a lot that we have told today. I will probably go quickly through this slide. So we have also converted a lot of stuff that is in Drupal 7, um, like formatters, widgets, and field types. So this is Drupal 7, formatters, hooks. They were not really hooks. They were kind of magic callbacks. And they were kind of quirky to work with, especially if you wanted to override them or if you wanted to have different ways of viewing a value, you had to switch dance, and it could get really ugly really, really fast. Um, and those functions were lost um, in your module file, and yeah, we moved that on. So we have now plugins. Um, we have a plugin system in Drupal 8. I will not dive into the plugin system because that is worth another hour or two or three, maybe, I don't know. Um, so quickly, some examples. We have um, field formatter plugins. They have interfaces, they're now object classes. Um, we provided some helper base uh, uh, classes for you. Um, if you're a Contrib module developer and you have uh, formatters, you will probably usually just extend from the formatter base class um, because it does a lot of um, stuff for you for free. Um, yeah, just use it. Um, so no more info hooks. Um, you use annotations like every single plugin that exists in uh, Drupal 8. Um, this is an example, so we have the annotation, a field formatter annotation, you have an ID, you have a label, and then you've specified the field types where it works on. So really easy, and it, it extends on the formatter base. Um, just use it, it's really, really handy. Um, <clears throat> since we have classes, we can have inheritance, um, which is way much easier and much nicer to look at um, than in Drupal 7. So this is um, how it is for the number 
formatter in core, there's a default number formatter which <laughs> implements some methods. Um, but then there's some little differences. You just extend on it and you override that method and you're done. So really, really, really easy to work with um, than in Drupal 7. And then you also had field types. Um, I, also, I should also just mention, uh, this is the same for widgets. Yeah, we have a widget uh, base class. Um, if, you have, if you want to provide widgets, just extend from it. It's really, really easy. Um, the same thing happened from field types. Uh, we just moved them to field type plugin type. Um, this is an example of uh, field formatters, field types, and widgets uh, on the right. Um, the interface is field item interface, which is really nice. You can probably ex explain it a little bit better than me. Yeah, but so the thing is that the class that you implement in order to code a new field type, <laughs> that class needs to implement field item interface, meaning the class that you code is actually the, the class of the values of that field type. So what you code is a, 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 an object that is a field value for your field type coding its own behavior. That's uh, the logic. It's slightly easier to, to, to view it that way. All right. So this is the field item interface. One nice thing that we've added really recently is um, the nice function generate sample value. It more or less means that we have deval generate in Drupal core 8 now. So really nice uh, to use. Um, <laughs> this is an example of the link item uh, field type. <clears throat> As again, you use annotations, you describe um, what their default widgets are going to be, the default formatters, and also the constraints and uh, things like that. I'm going really fast because we're more or less at the end of our session, I think. Um, we have entity displays in um, Drupal 8 now. So entity displays, um, if you looked at the definition of a field instance in Drupal 7, um, that instance holds all the information how a field was rendered in your entity. So there was a lot of arrays there again. Um, it was kind of annoying as well. Um, for instance, for display suite and field groups, we had no way to reuse something in Drupal core and we had to use our own storage. And so a lot of stuff was loaded at runtime and yeah, memory more or less exploded. So <clears throat> in Drupal 8, we have the entity display, we have an entity view display, and we have an entity form display. So the, it's a config entity, and it stores how your entity is going to be rendered for a certain bundle and view mode. So it lists all the components in there, like say a title or the body, with the settings for that certain bundle and view mode. Um, this is an example, so if you look at content, uh, in the array, you have a body, field, image, and then also the line code. So it only stores what actually needs to be rendered. There was kind of a problem in D7 because we had no clue who needed to be rendered, so we loaded everything, and then, yeah, a lot of memory. So this is a new addition. It has a really nice API, so you can just say, uh, give me the display for node article teaser, and you can add or remove components and add settings to them. Um, one nice thing is that we're probably going to add a new, uh, or we're going to add an API edition here that will allow to inject any kind of thing in there. <laughs> so we need a new name for that, I think. Yeah, you, yeah the, components. The, components. So the components. The components are ba basically all the entries that you will find in the render array for an entity. You will find an entry per field that is being rendered, but we also have like third-party modules like Display like suite, field groups, typically they add and they reshuffle things in your entity render array. And so the, 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 the whole metaphor for the entity view display things was it's supposed to be the full recipe for where, wh how an entity is going to be displayed, meaning it needs to be able to accept uh, uh, components from a contrib, like a field group component that has a parent or that knows it has children in there. So we need to, we still need to make that extendable. But the thing is that, yeah, that object is, c contains everything there is to know about how to render that entity. Yes. So how you work with it, if, if entity view is called, then it will load the relevant display for you. Um, you can implement alter hooks, so you get the display recipe for you and then you can just call at components or uh, set components or remove components at runtime. It's way easier to mess with the display in Drupal 8 than it was in Drupal 7. You had to implement a lot of hooks there and ah, it was not fun to work with. So it's all available 
Um, so like I said, we have the same for entity form displays. They just are the recipe for how your form looks like. Um, and it allows us to have four modes. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> So if you have any questions, you can go up to the mic over there, and then we'll try to answer. Hi, uh, my name is Gibran. Uh, I maintain a dynamic entry reference in Drupal 8 Contrib. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all on working on and revamping the entity API. It's been, you know, pleasure working with uh, all the revamp things and stuff. Uh, it's been really easy for me to, you know, create a new entity, a uh, new field type with all the changes. So, one thing I struggle with is the schema of formatters, types, and widgets. So, how can I generate automatically or, you know, uh, how can I work with that? Is there any advice from you guys? I, I, I'm not sure I understood the question, sorry. So, s schema API, I have to um, implement the schema for widgets and uh, for field types and for matters. You need to provide the schema for your field type, but that's, that's it. There are, like, widgets and formatters are not involved in there. No, but for, for so the uh, settings, I have to provide the schema as well. No, so schema, uh, translation schema API. Con the config schema? Conf sorry, config schema, yeah. Right. So I am struggling to write config schema for my... Uh, uh, okay, for to, so to provide some context, all, all of those uh, say, yeah, you, 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 you implement a field type. That field type defines a collection of settings that are specifically relevant for that field type and that would make no sense for another field type. So those, the value of those settings are stored for each field definition, each configurable field definition, they, they are stored in a YAML file. And the config system requires, uh, uh, it has a, a, a schema API to be able to figure out the, the parts, which is what, and what is, what is of what type within a YAML file. Yeah. So yeah, you have this uh, part of the, uh, of the field config schema, a uh, YAML file, whose content depends on the field type. So it's hard to provide, it's, we, the field API cannot provide a generic schema for the, this piece in the, uh, in, in, in the field schema um, record, so the, it's, it's the, the field type that needs to provide it. And there's, yeah, there's an API for that. It's not completely easy. Uh, it's, it, it's doable. It probably needs some explanation, but it's doable. Okay. I won't explain that here, but thank you. Yeah, and it works. It works exactly the same way for for every config entity. So, as soon as you have something that stores the configuration, you have to attach the, that schema, and it's just exactly the same uh, for the configurable field types. So, hello. Uh, another question: What's going on with bundles? Because I've noticed that uh, it's not required for some entities, and some entities doesn't have bundles or have bundled property with a null value. That's why lots of crunch inside of code. What are the, the decision to allow not bundable values, uh, entities? Uh, so it's been a polemical topic. I mean, within the, 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 the team, we, we aren't, uh, yeah, entity types without bundles, uh, large parts of the APIs assume the, well, rec uh, rely on the fact that you can speak about the entity type and bundle of an entity. Some, some code, especially storage, needs to know the bundle of an entity. So uh, in D7, like an entity type without bundle, say user, all the entities have the same bundle, which is the same name as the entity type. And yeah, it, it, there, there are a couple issues with that. I, th this, this array m might still change a bit in Drupal 8 because we're, we're not sh completely sure how we're going to uh, deal with those. 
it's a bit complex because an entity type could start out without any bundle, but a country module could start adding bundles to it. So the fact that an entity type does not have any, any bundles is not, is not really constituent of that entity type. This might change in time. So yeah, well, uh, next entire code, uh, this entity type is cloned into the bundle, uh, bundle value. And I'm wondering why isn't the entity type? And that's already the case, and it's working basically like that. We just have to solve like the extension problem, like when you then a module like adds additional bundles to that later on, that you make sure that it stays consistent and like the original automatically created bundle is still there. Thanks. Um, hi, this one is for uh, Weichert. When you um, define a field storage definition, um, you have to set an entity type, I noticed on the slides. Um, in Drupal 7, when you defined well, a field, then it was reusable across all entity types. So what's up with that? Is right, that so still the case? Good, good, uh, good catch and good question. We chose not to delve in that in, in the slides, but yes, yeah, so one of the changes that were made that actually is, is a consequence, is, is one of the consequences of um, <laughs> Storing an entity is the job of the storage handler, but the storage handler is defined by the entity type, and different entity types might have different storages. One entity type could be stored in SQL, and the other could be stored in Mongo. So in D7, you could actually use the same field across different entity types. This actually made no sense, because using the same field across various places is only ever um, useful if you want to query across those different kind of things. And you can only query uh, within a given entity type. You cannot write a query that retrieves users and nodes. Yeah. You can only select all the nodes that blah, blah, blah. But So it actually made no real sense. And it, was, it turned out that it was actually an, uh, a, a, an anti-feature. It was more painful than than useful. It was painful because when you created a field, you could never ever be sure that some other random module would not create a field, a completely unrelated field with the same name on an, another entity type. And so de facto, it had, you had to adopt a practice of prefixing your field names with your entity type if you wanted to be sure that you would avoid clashes. And so what happened in D8 is that like we clustered you, what happens regarding the fields within an entity type has no relationship at all with what happens with the field within an, an, another entity type, meaning you can, have a, you can add a field with the same name to node and to users. They don't have anything in common. It's just a different field. It's basically namespaced by entity type. Yeah. So, um, yeah, talking about a field storage, it always relates to a specific entity type. Then um, one more small question for Wolfgang. Um, in Entity API in uh, Drupal 7, you had a UI controller, which defined some paths for you automatically. I missed that in the slides. Is that still the case or not? Um, no, actually the, the UI controller, I think, is right now um, the only thing of Entity API module that has still no Drupal 8 uh, variant of, but um, there's actually like um, auto-generated routes for your, for your entity type already in, in Drupal 8, what means like you, you get like um, a page to view your, your entity and, and stuff like that, uh, but there's still no like um, feature complete uh, UI which you can get like with the UI controller in, in, in Drupal 8. So that's still something that has to be like ported and, and implemented for, for Drupal 8. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, just from a developer point of view, okay, um, I'm minding if we will be still able to use a function from the devil module like DPM with the Krumo interface. I mean, we use developing, we used to inspect uh, objects uh, like nodes and values and whatever with DPM function uh, will list uh, object properties, <coughs> no, like properties and also values of the arrays, but this seems to, in this case, in Drupal 8, seems that uh, we are getting these values 
mostly as uh, methods of the classes. Uh, I mean, will DPM function will still work and print uh, the values in the same way, or will be some matters about this? So the um, regular DPM function doesn't work with, with Drupal 8 entities, also because they contain like um, um, cyclic references, uh, what makes it break. Um, but what I would expect it is that uh, an improved version like comes up which just integrates with entities and uh, lists all the data that is an entity because it, all the API is there to, to fetch the data and to visualize it. So it's just a matter of integrating it uh, with the entity API. And of course you can still like uh, use tools like Xdebug in your IDA to, to look at it. What I would say is to me is the most convenient, but uh, I would expect tools like DPM to like a, sh a short, so DPM of entity won't work, but DPM of entity to array will just print out oh, okay. the values as an array. And same thing for if what you want to DPM is a field item list or an item, a field item, uh, I think D uh, DPM on those will just fail, but you can use the to array method, method to downcast to that to an array and see what's inside. So we list the values, not yes. just. Yes, it's, it's, it's kind of a consequence of the, the, the nice, easy syntax that we right. showed. It's, yeah. well, it, it relies on magic uh, getters and setters. It, it's what you have is not an, an object which has the actual properties like body, title, etc. Right. They don't exist as object properties. It's more complicated than that. So exactly. yeah, debugging is slightly more difficult, but the two array, if you want to see what's in there, what are the values, to array uh, uh, will work for that. And uh, the entity field uh, metadata wrap, the entity metadata wrapper will not exist anymore. It will, will be, I mean, in bundled now is a native sort of wrapping. Yeah, you, you don't need the entity metadata wrap anymore because it's like the built-in API is exactly the, the same improved API it yeah. provided in Drupal 7, so it's built in basically. Yeah. Thank you so much, really great work. Hi, so um, my question is about entity form modes, but these were only briefly mentioned in the talk. Um, so I can think of lots of really interesting uses for entity form modes. Uh, for example, if I was implementing workflow, I might want to have a, a different, uh, show a different entity form uh, at each stage of the workflow and just present the fields that were relevant to that that workflow step or something, or, or, um, or base it on the role of the user who was there. So if I was looking at, uh, so my question is how do I actually use a different one? Uh, if it was the view modes, there's a handy hook uh, for hook entity view mode alter, where I can just change the name. But there doesn't seem I, to be I hate that hook. I mean, it's, it's great, but it's painful to support. So um, there doesn't seem to be an easy equivalent for form modes. I had a look around, and I've seen form mode names uh, for, say, like user.register is in the, in the routing uh, YAML files. So how, how do I intercept that and decide to use a different form mode? Do I go into routing subscribers or, or what? Yeah, I would say, yeah, you, you write your own route and just call a form with a new form mode. So instead of like intercepting somewhere, you, you do the, your own form and call it that way and pass the right form mode. Okay, and so I'll just make a new entity form controller class and say, but, but it will use this form mode as it's, okay. But then again, like it wouldn't work for us if, if that form is displayed, for instance, in a block, you could have a side block that is a short form for an entity. And then, yeah, we, prob we probably miss an, an extension point to let you switch the form mode of a f an entity form before it's displayed. We, yeah, it's very p possible that we are missing that at the moment. Okay, right. Please file an issue. Thanks. Hi, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for all the great, uh, great stuff in here. Uh, my question concerns, to, uh, concerns itself with the cardinalities of fields. Uh, in one of our old websites on Drupal 7, we, uh, we several times had the uh, experience we wanted to use the same field across several uh, content types, but in different cardinalities. In effect, we had to create a new field each time and, and prefix it or something to, to discern that this was the single-valued field and this was, you know, multi-valued field. Uh, what's the situation now in Drupal 8? I, I saw you still had the cardinalities on your field storage, so it's really the same or? Okay. 
Ba yeah, basically, the, the cardinality affects affects the storage yeah, because yeah. Uh, so it was it, it it's been kind of of a back and forth in CCK D6. CCK did all kind of crazy stuff to move your data around whenever you changed a setting that required a change in in the in the storage layout, mm. and it was kind of it was. Yeah, it was, it was kind of scary. Like, we're taking your data and we're putting them in another column in a table. Like, usually it works fine, but then if you happen to have, like, millions of records in there, we're not actually sure we're able to manipulate that safely within a single uh, atomic operation that won't break. It, it was kind of, and it, 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 pissed, it, it pissed everyone off. Like, where is my field stored? We didn't have a, an entity field query back then, meaning you could, like, people tended to write direct SQL queries against tables in the database that would just break the moment someone switched the cardinality or did something else and, and you had code, you had white pages. Um, so in D7, what was done was like, nah, everything, every field in its own table, that's it, we have a field cache. It, the, and and we, we, like, we don't care about base fields, because it makes sense for them, all of them, to be in the same table because it's way more efficient. But like the configurable fields, in a sense, they can change over on, on us. So we, we are like cautious and we store them uh, each in, in its own table. Back in D8, uh, well, we, the storage needs to take care of both. So it's, we're back in a situation where some uh, fields are stored in a base table and some fields are stored in, in its own table, in their own table. And we still want to remain cautious about how do we move from one to the other. And uh, the fact that a, a base field is multiple means it's going to be stored in a separate table. If the base field is single, it's going to be stored in. So it has to be the same for all, it, it has to be a, a property of the storage. So, yeah, it's not going to change. No, it's okay. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, typically you would want to have either single or multi. That's really, <laughs> you know. That's Sorry, really, come again? Uh, it's just, uh, it, uh, typically we won't need to, to divide them into a uh, cardinality of two or three and four, but just single, so what or, could single be or multi. Done, what could be done, and so we, it, it would be doable, we just didn't have the time to, to, to get to it. it that. Like, you set a cardinality on the storage, and then you can set a lower cardinality on, on the field side. And that might work. We just didn't got to it. Sure. Oh, thanks. Uh, hi. Also, thanks for all the work. I think it's a question for Swentel uh, on the view modes for forms or, or for display. What's the, the current recommended approach to get some layouts? Or I don't know what the, what the correct terminology is now, or designs in there, like a tree column design for your form or something like that. Yeah, is there cooperation with panels? Because I think your display suites, mm -hmm. uh, are there plans there? Or, or <coughs> do, you, do you use templates or something like that? Or um, There are plans we, 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 like for instance, the display suite at this point is already completely ported for Drupal 8, so we, we as Polishes and me are going to try and release it by the end of the year. There are talks to introduce, we had a layout module at some point in core, and then we removed it. Yeah. Um, we are, are discussing whether to introduce it again and have like a base display class in core so that both panels and display suite can use it. That's, that's the idea right now. I have no clue what, when it might get in. Um, but that's the idea, and it would be handy because it's kind of annoying that panels has their own classes and we use our own. Yeah, and panels yeah. seems to be splitting up everything into page manager, uh, yeah, yeah. display module, or whatever. Yeah. So, but that's so yeah, <laughs> there, there are hangouts, um, and we, there are some notes somewhere on groups of triple.org about the situation right now. So, um, yeah, there will happen something, but I can't really tell when and why. And, and so, and what's the correct term then to look for it? It's the the layout module you call it? E, yeah, oh, I think, yeah, layouts in core again. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I tried to play a bit with the field, so to create a custom field, and I observed that uh, after the field is created, I couldn't disable actually the model. So is there any possibility to, I mean, to not search for all the fields what I created and to delete manually? and just disable the model and uh, delete everything what I... Uh, 
So yeah, this is something, it's a, yeah, it's a complex, like a really painful area. Uh, we, add, we, we add to add that behavior at some point in, in D7, I early in the, after 7.0, I think, but it was like late in the cycle. Uh, that, yeah, you can't remove a, a, a module that provides a field type if there are still fields of that type around because then like, it's just data that sits in your database that we can't do anything about because we don't even know what they are. Uh, be, because we have lost the code that knows how to deal with those with those data. So, and it was like, yeah, there, there were weird cases where uh, you could uh, disable a module, re-enable it, and 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 meanwhile, if you have if you have loaded and saved an entity, your data is basically like screwed, uh, so we, there was no way to ensure data integrity while uh, um, allowing that. So we had, yeah, we had to forbid, uh, prevent the disappearance of a field type while, while there are still fields of, of that type. Um, how th have things been any better? I mean, yeah, if, if, you, want, if you want to remove a module that provides a field type, you need to, rem to delete all the fields first. Uh, and we have a purge process that happens on Cron. We, we need to wait that all the, s the, f the values that are stored in the database have, um, that we had a, an opportunity to remove them cleanly and react to the fact that they are being removed uh, before you can, you, you can remove that, uh, that, that uh, module. It's, Yes, it's a bit of a pain point, and we don't have much better to offer. Um, I think part of the problem is that we still need to unify the, the purging process, and uh, the plan actually is that once we unify the purging process, we can also like clean the data for all of the, the base fields where the field type has been used, and then we can actually provide you with the functionality that does it. Uh, like when you uninstall that you click in confirmation, this is going to delete quite some data, but it could be done automatically. Yeah, then. I mean, I, I, an easy, an easy it, just no one did it. An easy way out kind of of this would be like just to provide a, a, a UI, for a, a batch progress bar. To You want to remove that module. Okay, we're going to clean up all your data. That might take a while, but do you want to do it now? And then you stare at a progress bar uh, uh, for how, uh, as long as it takes, if you're lucky, like you do, you're not doing it on a on a huge database, at least not in production, and and uh, and then it's done. Like you don't have to wait for a couple of days that enough cron runs have happened and and check re regularly. Is it okay? Can I remove it now? No, not yet. Come back tomorrow. Maybe that would be one way to address it, but it and it would be easy. Just no one took the time to write it. But I was thinking that, uh, okay, I'm playing with the code so I can easily um, call a function which will return uh, to which entity or entities the field belongs to. So I can delete easily, but let's say if I'm a site builder, I will activate the model, so I will add to several entities. And uh, then actually I want to disable and I have no information about the field where it belongs to, so I have to search in the back office and that's why I asked. And uh, one more question, yesterday it was a session about uh, also uh, uh, about the fields and translation and uh, there was a uh, interesting uh, feedback that if you want to change the properties of the fields, I mean the information, then actually you have to go to the uh, status page and you have to run the uh, rebuild or update for the database, right? So there's a option. And uh, the problem was that you can't re uh, change uh, the information if you already have contents. And that's a bit painful, right? Because if you have already content and you want just to add one more information, why we don't have uh, a fallback, for example, okay, we already have contents, but uh, let's say the the value is null, 